On today's show, we talk to two-time Grammy Award winner and four-time Grammy nominee saxophonist Ernie Watts. We talk about how he got his start playing music and how he developed, working with Buddy Rich, Thelonious Monk, his extensive studio work in the 70s and 80s, his Grammy Award-winning recordings, his improvisational style as a solo artist, his solo discography, and much, much more. Stay tuned. You're listening to The Nikhil Hogan Show. And welcome back to the Nikhil Hogan Show. My guest today is two-time Grammy Award winner and four-time Grammy nominee Ernie Watts. He has been playing the saxophone for more than 50 years and from the age 16 onwards he has been playing professionally. Initially, while still attending school, he won a downbeat scholarship to the Berklee College of Music in Boston. While studying at Berkeley, Watts was recommended by trombonist Phil Wilson, a Berkeley professor, to replace Gene Quill in Buddy Rich's big band and left Berkeley to stay with Buddy Rich from 1966 to 1968. And he toured the world, also recording two albums with the band Big Swing Face and The New One. Next, Watts moved to L.A. and began working in the big bands of Gerald Wilson and Oliver Nelson. With the Nelson Band, Watts visited Africa on a U.S. State Department tour in 1969. In addition, Watts had the occasion to record with the legendary Thelonious Monk on the album Monk's Blues, a Columbia album. During the 70s and 80s, Watts immersed in the busy production scene of L.A. His signature sound was heard on countless TV shows and movie scores, almost all all the early West Coast Motown sessions, and with pop stars such as Aretha Franklin and Steely Dan. Watts has been featured on over 500 recordings by artists ranging from Cannonball Adderley to Frank Zappa. In 1982, Watts won the Grammy for Best Pop Instrumental Performance for Chariots of Fire theme, dance version. In 1983, Watts performed with Charlie Hayden's Liberation Music Orchestra and also toured with Pat Metheny's Special Quartet. In 1985, Watts won the Grammy for Best R&B Instrumental Performance, Orchestra, Group, or Soloist for Musician. Watts's charter membership in Hayden's critically acclaimed Quartet West continued for almost 30 years until Hayden's death. He has recorded 15 albums as a leader for a variety of labels, large and small, and in 2004, Watts started Flying Dolphin Records, releasing a series of critically acclaimed albums such as Alive, Spirit Song, Analog Man, To The Point, 4 Plus Floor, Oasis, and 2016's Wheel of Time. Ernie Watts, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. What a thrill to have the great Ernie Watts on the show. I think maybe we should begin with, you mentioned in an interview that really you started uh, in the modal scene of jazz, so to speak, with Coltrane and Miles. Could you talk a little bit of how you really got started playing the saxophone when you were young in Delaware? Yeah, I was in school, uh, and uh, it was the beginning of the school year. I was in grade 7, and I think I was like 13 at the time. And the school had instruments to lend for uh, young people to learn how to play. So uh, I was with a friend of mine, and he wanted to go and get a saxophone. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I wasn't particularly drawn to learning how to play a musical instrument. So I just kind of, I just sort of went with him, you know. And uh, we got to the music department of the school, and my friend got a tenor saxophone. He wanted a saxophone. He got a tenor saxophone. And uh, I figured I'd try the trombone, you know, I must have seen the Glenn Miller story or something like that on TV the week before, and it seemed like the trombone would be a nice idea. So I asked the teacher, and uh, it happened that the music department was all out of trombones, and uh, the teacher uh, had told me that they had a baritone saxophone, so I started on the baritone saxophone because I was tall for my age, and the pe- and the teacher figured I would be able to carry it in marching band. So you know, there's a big marching band tradition here in the U.S. So uh, I, that's how I started on the saxophone. So uh, my very first instrument was a baritone sax. Now, did you have a private teacher, or did you all learn at the school? 
I started in the school, and uh, I got interested personally, and so I started practicing every day myself. You know, my parents didn't have to um, force me to practice. It was always something that I chose to do myself. And as it happened, after I had been playing the baritone for a short amount of time, the school got an alto saxophone. And uh, I tell people when I tell this story, I tell them uh, I the school got an alto saxophone and the teacher let me start playing the alto because I was carrying the baritone back and forth from school to my home every day. And the teacher noticed that my right arm was four inches longer than my left arm. So therefore he let me have the alto. So that's how I started on the alto saxophone. So that's my little joke I tell <laughs> when I do workshops with for the kids and stuff. So I started playing alto saxophone, and uh, our school did not have a jazz program, so I started learning classical saxophone of repertoire, for the saxophone and studying classical music. And uh, at that time, I started to study privately. So I had a private teacher for saxophone. I had a private teacher for classical. And uh, I studied all the literature for saxophone, for classical saxophone. What kind of, uh, if I could pry, what sort of, what particular pieces or etude books were you using at the time? Well, there's a... There's a great saxophone book that I started out on, which uh, was called The Universal Method for Saxophone. It's, uh, it was by, uh, written by a man named Paul DeVille. That was my first big uh, book, my first big classical book. But I studied out of the Rubank books, and then as I kept practicing and kept studying, I started to play a lot of the French music for saxophone. Uh, there was a great, great, great classical saxophone player named Marcel Mule, and there was a lot of music written for him, uh, and uh, I started playing a lot of the sonatas and a lot of the piano and saxophone pieces uh, that were written for French uh, for the French saxophonist, and my pian my saxophone teacher was an excellent piano player, so I began to do uh, saxophone competitions, and I won uh, several saxophone competitions playing these classical pieces with uh, with my piano uh, with 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 my saxophone teacher who played piano. And so I, uh, I won uh, several competitions, and then from that, I was asked to perform a very, very famous saxophone piece uh, by a composer named Jacques Ebert, and it was and it's called the Concertina de Camera for saxophone and orchestra. And so when I was about 16 or 17 or so, I performed that. Uh, piece with the uh, Delaware Symphony Orchestra, uh, which was made up of mem members of the Philadelphia Orchestra and members of the uh, of people in Wilmington, Delaware, there where I grew. So I played that piece when I was about 16, and at the same time that I was uh, studying classical saxophone. I started to learn to play jazz by ear. So I was playing and practicing jazz from listening to records and also playing classical music. So my, my background as a player has always been a balanced thing between the, the technical aspect of playing the instrument correctly, you know, playing, playing the classical music, playing in tune, learning all the scales, that aspect of playing the saxophone uh, joined with the intuitive aspect of playing, with improvisation, uh, with, with playing by ear, training my ear, 
and learning to play things from hearing also. So I, my playing has always been a combination between the between the classical aspect and then the intuitive aspect of playing. Do you have perfect pitch, or do you have very strong relative pitch? Yeah, I don't have perfect pitch. I have, you know, I guess you would call it relative pitch, just from playing for years and years and years, you know. I, I can generally hear... Uh, hear notes and know what the notes are and I can generally hear the chords and know what the what the chords are that way just from practice just from time just from study now when it comes to all the scales you mentioned uh, if we could go just a little bit technical you're referring to almost every scale right the major the all the the, the minors and the so is it fair to say at that age of 16 you had all your scales down uh, that way yeah classically and then what I learned after a while, see, I was learning how to play jazz by ear. And when I graduated from high school, uh, I went to teacher's college for a year because when I told my mother I wanted to be a musician, uh, she got very, very concerned about my starving to death as a musician. So she wanted me to go to uh, college and get a teacher's degree, so I would have something to fall back on if I, you know, if if I didn't make it as a professional musician. So I went to the Westchester State Teachers College in Pennsylvania for a year for my mom, and uh, that didn't really work out for me. So what happened was I dropped out of. School, I told my mom that I did really didn't work for me, and she understood that. I dropped out of school, and I taught privately in Wilmington, Delaware, for a while. I taught beginners. I taught kids in schools, you know. And then, during that period, that short period of time, I auditioned for uh, a scholarship, the saxophone scholarship, to the Berklee School of Music in Boston. Uh, I won the Berkeley School Scholarship. So when I went to Berkeley, what I learned was, you know, I had been playing jazz by ear. I had been studying the classical saxophone repertoire. So I was playing my instrument well. Uh, I knew the scales. I knew the scales in a classical manner. And when I, got, when I went to Berkeley, I learned that there was a scale for every chord. I learned that every chord has a scale that works for it. And so I learned that if you learn all the scales for all the chords, then it's impossible to make a mistake. It's impossible to play a wrong note if you know all the scales for all the chords. So I systematically learned all of that system, you know, by practicing and playing with records. And I had been playing gigs with people when I was in high school, playing in dance bands and getting together with my friends and playing jam sessions. So I was playing things, and I was playing from records that I heard. You know, I really loved John Coltrane, so I was listening to Coltrane all the time. And so... A lot of the things that I was doing by ear, when I went to Berkeley, I found out what the names of them were. You know, I was already playing the lines. I was already playing from hearing other people solo, jazz, uh, fashion music. You know, I was playing jazz. I was playing like John Coltrane, but I just didn't know what it was. You know, I was listening to Coltrane. I was listening to Charlie Parker. I was listening to Eric Dolphy and Ornette Coleman and all of those people and playing with those records. So I was playing that music, but I didn't know what the names of the scales were and stuff that worked. So that's what helped me so much when I went to Berkeley. It was like I learned the scale for the chord, and then whenever I played a dominant chord or saw a dominant chord, I knew it was a Mixolydian scale. And then I said, oh, that's the sound. That's the scale. And so then I just systematically learned all the scales for all the chords that way and, and integrated that information into my playing. 
Wilmington, you mentioned in an interview some real heavyweight musicians came out of Delaware. Could you mention a couple of those? Well, Clifford Brown, who was a great, great, great uh, trumpet player, a uh, great by player, Lynn Winchester. And then the other thing about Wilmington is it was like when I was a kid, you know, driving from Wilmington to Philadelphia took about an hour and a half. Now it's like or half an hour on the train. But in Philadelphia, there was a gigantic jazz scene. It was incredible. I mean, John Coltrane lived in Philadelphia. Benny Golson lived there. Lots of great, great musicians uh, lived and came out of Philadelphia. And so that energy, that music energy was close to me. Uh, I didn't get to play with Clifford Brown. I didn't meet John Coltrane and Benny Golson at that time because I was a kid. You know, I was like the next generation. You know, you know, so I couldn't get in the clubs and that kind of stuff. But all of those people were in that area. You know, when I was in high school, I went to hear Cannonball Adderley play. He went. Uh, he was from New York, and he had his group with Yusef Latif. They came to the University of Delaware to do a concert, and then I met Cannon, and we talked, and we got along, and he let me play his instrument after the concert. You were a young man. What did you ask Cannonball Adderley? Oh, I just asked him about what reeds he used. I asked him about his mouthpiece. He let me play his horn after the concert. I asked him if I could try his horn so I could see how it felt, and he said, sure, that would be fine but he wanted to do his concert first, and then after that I could come back and try his instrument. And we talked some more, and he was a very, very helpful, very kind man. And then later on, when I was working in L.A., he came to L.A., he, he, he moved to L.A., and I did several recordings with Cannonball, and we did some concerts around L.A. also. Let's go chronologically. So at, at Berkeley, your professor recommended you onto the uh, to replace Gene Quill in Buddy Rich's band. Now, I have a friend who is a Buddy Rich fanatic. He loves Buddy Rich. So I got to ask for his sake, what was Buddy Rich like personally working with Buddy? Well, he was very, very helpful. He was very, very focused on his music. You know, he was the greatest, I think he was the greatest drummer, technically, that there ever has been. I mean, he did things on the drums that were just so smooth and so clear and so fast. I've never really heard anybody else. Well, you said helpful. What what did you mean by him being helpful to you as a young man? Well, he was always very supportive of the music. He was always very supportive of my practicing and studying and playing, and he was helpful about that. We talked about all the people that he played with. You know, he played with Charlie Parker. He played with Ben Webster. He played with all the great players, you know, so we talked about that. Any interesting anecdotes that he shared with you? You know, I can't remember of anything exactly except the fact that everybody used to talk about how abrasive he was, you know, about he's, how angry he was. And he all, there's all these stories about Buddy Rich getting in arguments and all of that with people. But the thing that I learned from Buddy was the fact that he was interested in the music. He was interested in having his music played correctly. And if you were serious about your music, and if you were serious about working for him and playing his music, he was fine. There was no problem. The only problems that he had with people was when they didn't take care of their business. You know, he would say, he would say there's 24 hours out of the day, and all he needed from us was to be responsible, you know, look decent on stage, and play the music for four hours a day. He said out of 24 hours a day, all he needed from us was for us to take care of business and be responsible for four hours out of a 24-hour day. And some people had trouble getting that together. And the people that had the tr had trouble getting to the bandstand and making it work for that four hours a day, he had a problem with that. And then he would get angry. 
and that was totally understandable. What I like about you, Ernie, is you're such a pro. You're such a professional. Like you can kind of slot in into any situation, and you you're just so good at like just doing your work like a real professional. I mean, that's you bring you bring a real uh, integrity to 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 a gig, you know. So Buddy must have loved you. Yeah, we got along very well. So it was a it was a good experience. It was a good relationship. How does he practice? Does uh, he? I, I know from your watching your videos, you're a big advocate of practicing a number of hours a day. Was he similar in that regard? Well, you know, he was a special kind well, he of said, person. He said he d- didn't practice. Is is that true? He didn't practice much. He probably, you know, he probably pra- he did his practicing when we got to the concert for sound checks and stuff like that. But you have to remember that he had been playing his whole life. See, he was playing from the time he was a year and a half old. He grew up in he grew up in vaudeville. His family was on the road. They had an act, so they went all they traveled all around the country, and they did these theater concerts and stuff. And when Buddy was a little baby. He would go with his family, and he'd sit by the band. He'd sit by the the, the orchestra pit, and while his while his mom and dad were doing their thing, they I think they were song and dance people. I think they they did they had an act. He would sit by the bandstand, and when she was a little baby, he started tapping out things with the band and tapping out things with the drummer and he was making all the breaks and they recognized that in him and so when he was like a year and a half two years old he started to become a a little drummer he was called traps the baby wonder you know he was a drum wonder when he was a little kid so he played all his whole life so he grew up in music that way you know, he was a gifted person. He didn't read music. Uh, he learned music from listening and then playing it. When we would learn new music with Buddy's band, we would sit in the sta- on the stage in the club or the hall, wherever we were, and we played the arrangement two or three times, and Buddy would listen to it. We'd play it without the drums, and he would listen to what we played. And then he would get up on the bandstand and he would play the, the drum parts. He would create drum parts. He would create his, his thing. So he was very gifted that way and he played his whole life. So I guess he was really practicing his whole life, you know. Let's, let's move forward to when you moved to L.A. and you worked with Oliver Nelson. Could you talk a little bit about that and the big band that he ran? How is that different coming from Buddy's big band? Well, it wasn't a lot different. You know, Oliver was a Oliver was a more mellow person and he was very, very, very educated. I mean, he really knew his music. He knew about music. And uh I knew uh, I knew Oliver's music from the things that he did with Eric Dolphy, you know, Blues in the Abstract Truth and those things that he did for Seven Piece Band. I knew Oliver from his big band arrangements that were incredible. He did an album called Afro-American Sketches that was just one of the great albums that I remember as a, as a young man. So when I met him, I was familiar with his music, and uh, I started playing in his band. He wanted me to play with his, with his group. So uh, I played with his big band. And I also did a State Department tour of Africa with Oliver, with a with a small group, with a seven piece band like the size of that band that did Blues and the Abstract Truth. And uh, I did TV. He came to L.A. to work on TV shows and films and stuff. And so I played on his TV shows. He did a show called The Six Million Dollar Man. And I played on all, I played on those shows and lots of concerts. So he was, you know, he was a great musician. Around that time, you got the opportunity to record with Thelonious Monk. And uh, could you talk about that that event uh, on Monk's Blues? What was that session like? Well, that was a project with, with Oliver. 
That was a project of Oliver's. It was Monk's band and a big band that Oliver did all the arrangements for. And so I played lead alto on that project, and uh, that was Oliver's arrangements of Monk's tunes. And I met, and I got a chance to meet Colonius Monk, and we talked a bit. Yeah, what did you guys talk about? Because I've heard he's not the easiest person to talk to. Well, he was very quiet, you know, and it was right before he he got ill. You know, he was getting older then. We just, I just told him that I really appreciated his music and I really enjoy what he did, and you know, and uh, I listened to him play, and he listened to me play a little bit, and you know, we just had a a a, a nice rapport. It just felt good being around him, and I enjoyed his company, and I think he. Company, so it was pleasant. Uh, anything that he, that stood out from your conversation with him? Well, basically, we were just getting the music together to perform. I mean, all of that music was new to us, and we were get, we were getting the music together to record. You know, when you work in the studios, you play the music, you rehearse the music down one time, and then you start recording. So the main thing we were talking about was was technical aspects of the music and making sure all the notes were right and making sure that all of the rhythms and things were right for the arrangement. So it was technical stuff about that music. And his saxophone player that he played with for years, he was there, Charles Rouse, who was a great saxophone player. And uh, it was just a very, it was a very nice interaction. And Oliver wrote some great charts, and uh, it turned out it turned out really well. Another thing I did another thing I did with Oliver was we did an album with Louis Belson's band and James Brown, and it was a James Brown album called Soul on Top. And James Brown, and it was Louis Belson's band. And Oliver Nelson wrote all the arrangements, and that was quite a, that was quite an adventure too. That was a lot of fun. You know, I'm sure you must have been answering all these questions about all the different people you've recorded with. But if you could uh, indulge me just just a little bit, I'm curious. Uh, so, uh, did you get to hang out with James Brown and, and talk to him as well? A little bit, yeah. He knew who I was, you know, from records and things like that. I played on a bunch of his records. See, because what they would do would a lot of the groups that toured like Earth, Wind and Fire and James Brown and uh, you know Marvin Gaye and the Temptations and all of those people, they recorded with with the studio musicians. They recorded with the people in LA that were doing all of the records because we read all the music correctly. We we played in tune. Everything was right the first time so a lot of the big groups that did these these big recordings they used us to do the recordings and then when they went on the road they had a road band that they used that traveled with them you know so i did a lot of rec- i did a lot of recording with a lot of pop groups and r&b groups and james brown you know i did i did several recordings with james brown because it was it was the studio people that got the parts right, and then when they went out on the road, they used their road band. It says you worked with Aretha Franklin as well, and she's a tremendous talent. Describe working with right. her. Well, that was a recording, and it was all done. A lot of the things that I did with people were things where the rhythm tracks were already done, and then we went in and we put the horn sections on, and then I sometimes would do a solo, you know, and I would do a solo over the pre-recorded track. And the stuff I did with Aretha was like that. It was horn, it was horn section things over the rhythm section parts that were already that were already done. A lot of pop music is like that. And she was very kind, and she was, you know, she was very gracious and nice lady. Uh, I did that with, uh, you know. With with quite a few, quite a few artists. Do you, yeah. you work with the Jackson Five as well? 
not when they were kids, not when they were little kids. When they got older, I did a bunch of stuff with them, and I did a, a bunch of stuff with uh, with Michael. You know, when he became a when he became a solo artist. And uh, what was it like yeah. working with with Michael? Well, they were all good people. You know. I get the sense that they're all very serious when it comes to what's going on in the studio and getting the things right. Yeah, because that's where the music really is, you know. The performance, what they do and their show and everything, that's their show. That's their that's their showbiz thing. That's their act. But when they're in the studio working on their music and working on, on writing and working on their parts, they're just good people trying to get their music done correctly and working to get things done technically so that it sounds really good. And then once the record is out, then you see what you see. You know, then the public sees what they see. They see the show. They see the, uh, they see the uh, act and all of that. But before all of that, the, the, the act and the show and everything is built on how that music sounds. And so from the beginning, it's about the music. And all of those people were very serious about their music. Uh, Marvin Gaye was very serious about his music. The Rolling Stones are very serious about their music. Can you describe uh, working with Marvin Gaye on Let's Get It On? And that was a very, very famous album in the history of music. What was it like working on that album and working with Marvin Gaye? Well, he had his own studio, and it was a private studio. He worked when he felt like it, and sometimes we worked late at night. Frank Zappa liked to work late at night, too. We used to have sessions that didn't start until 11 o'clock at night. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of people are, are, are night people, you know. So Marvin, uh, Marvin worked at night a lot, and uh, he, worked his, he worked out his rhythm sessions and stuff. And it was like I was telling you before, you know, when I got there, they had worked on the rhythm parts, and the rhythm tracks were done. Then we got together, and we talked about the, where the spaces were, where he wanted me to play, or where he wanted to do a horn part, a section part, and stuff like that. And then we would put, then we would put stuff together over the track. You know, and sometimes I would play a solo. Sometimes we would take a part and we would double it or do it in harmony and make section parts, you know, with, uh, with, with, with other people. I used to work a lot with, uh, with a trumpet player named Oscar Brashear and a trombone player named George Bohannon, and we did a lot of stuff from Motown and, and, uh, and, and different R&B projects that were put together in that way. You know, a lot of times the artist wasn't sure about composition and about what chords were right and voicings and that kind of stuff, but they had a part. You know, they knew where they wanted the horns to do a particular line. They knew what they wanted a particular sound to be, but they didn't know technically how to put it together and so we would help with that you know we put the chords together we'd say do you know would you like this kind of a sound or would you like this kind of a sound and then they picked what they like and then they, we would put the sound on we would put the part on yeah in many ways uh, ernie you you and and uh, your crew were really responsible for that iconic sound were you creating it from earlier influences or is it something that you guys made special for that decade. Did you feel the music changing in the pop sense that you were accommodating these changes? How did that iconic sound come about, the vocabulary for those recordings, so to speak? Well, basically, it was related to other things that were happening at the same time. You know, there was a sound. There were people that were, there were, people that were writing. There was a great writer that wrote for a lot of pop records. Uh, named Gene Page. He wrote a lot of stuff for string orchestras and 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 big uh, big projects. Like he did all of Barry White stuff, right? Barry White didn't didn't read music, 
But what Barry White would do was he'd sit at home and play his parts on his piano at home into a cassette machine. He would give what he played on the cassette to Gene Page. Gene Page would take what Barry gave him and he would orchestrate it for like 20 violins, you know, cellos, violas, and it would be a whole orchestra. You know, that Love Unlimited stuff that we used to do and all of those things? That was Gene Page. Yeah, Barry wrote the grooves. Barry wrote the melodies, and he had the concept. It was Barry's concept. But Gene Page orchestrated all of that music. And that's what a lot of people did. Uh, Jerry Hay, I worked for years with Jerry Hay. We worked with uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. And uh, Jerry Hay would get the information, and he would write the horn arrangements. So he, Jerry wrote a lot of horn arrangements. That's really interesting. Where, where all of those iconic sounds and those hits come from, all these really talented people are, are, are behind the scenes. That Names that most people don't typically know are really responsible for that, for that sound. Yeah, because they had, the, they had the technical knowledge. The artist had the feeling. The artist had the dream. And the people that helped were the musicians that knew about the harmony and what chords were and how to make it sound together. So it was always like it was always like interaction that way. There was a guy named James Carmichael that I did a whole bunch of stuff with at uh, at Motown, who did all of the uh, Commodore stuff, and I played on all that stuff. But he would write the he would write the arrangements. James would listen to what the track was or listen to what the music was. And then he would fill in the gaps, you know, the knowledge. How how should the where should the flute part be? Where should the you know the saxophone solo be, or where should the trumpets be? You know, there's a lot of people in there's a lot of people behind the scenes in the music business. I want to ask you. You mentioned Frank Zappa. It just shows the breadth of the amount of people that you've worked with. You really worked with almost everyone. And it's really impressive. A friend of mine, uh, a musician colleague, uh, Simon, Simon Hughes, he wanted to ask a question. You mentioned Frank w- worked late. How was he like? Was he a taskmaster? Was he a very strict guy? Uh, his music is very precise. Did he demand uh, very precise rehearsals and that co- kind of thing? He got really good musicians. Uh, his music was difficult. I thought of Frank Zappa as being a classical composer. I thought of him as being a contemporary classical composer that used a rock rhythm section. Uh, you know, he had the he he had the techniques of Alban Berg or any of these other people that he knew about classical, contemporary classical orchestral literature and so he embraced the rock thing and the classical thing together and that's how his music came together so note wise there was a lot of notes uh it was difficult to play but what he did was he knew the musicians he knew who could play his music and so he got people together that could play his music. And so the rehearsals were not really difficult. The re- I mean, the rehearsals were not hard because we practiced our parts so that when we got there and it was time to play, we could play that music. And uh, it was a lot of fun. He was a very bright man. So he must have loved you guys. You guys are all pros. Well, and he was a very and he was a very good musician, and he knew about classical and he knew about jazz, and so he was a lot of fun to work with, and he was very bright. So you know, we had a good time. Now I want to uh, go on to your work on the Tonight Show, which is a I mean that was 
that's like the biggest TV show. I mean, in that period, like everybody knew the Tonight Show, and you worked for 20 years working with the great Doc Severinsen. It was like going to school for me because in the trumpet section there was Conti Candoli, who was one of the great jazz trumpet players. There was Snooky Young, who was one of the great jazz trumpet players and lead players. You know, there were all of these people in the band that were masters of what they did. You know, there was Ed Shaughnessy, who was one of the great drummers. Uh, Ross Tompkins, who was a piano player that could play anything in any key. He was just amazing. Uh, I sat next to another, I had sat next to a tenor player named Pete Chrislieb that was just one of the great saxophone players. I learned so much about playing from playing with every day with him. You know, you learn to play every day from listening and sitting next to people who play great. You know, and then it was all the people that came on the show, you know, like Dizzy Gillespie would come on The Tonight Show. You'd talk with him, you'd listen to him play. You know, there was, uh, there, 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 there were all of these great people. Did you get a chance to talk to Dizzy and uh, ask him about music? Well, sure, you talk to everybody. They're all there, you know, and they're all just people. And Dizzy used to love to talk about music, you know, so... He, you know, everybody would hang out with Dizzy. He was just a very, very, very social. What did you guys talk about when it came to music? Well, really, he talked more. He talked more about time and uh, rhythm. He was very, very involved in. He was very, very involved in Cuban music, and so we talked about clave. We talked about how you use different instruments within the the, the Cuban rhythm section situation that kind of thing he was very involved in in the in the rhythmic aspect of music and you know of course harmony because he and charlie parker they revolutionized jazz harmony in the 40s from 1948 1949 he and he and charlie parker you know they created that thing called bebop you know they were they were the guys so uh he knew, he knew a lot, and he was a very, very, uh, very jovial, very sociable, pleasant pl- person. He was a lot of fun. Uh, talk about your Grammy Award-winning performance on the uh, Chariots of Fire theme, 1982, the dance version. Uh, do, what do you remember of that recording and, uh, and winning the Grammy for, for, for that piece? That was a project that was put together by, Ken, uh, by uh, Quincy Jones. And uh, the exact recording session for that I did in two days. I was working with the Rolling Stones. I was on the road with the Rolling Stones at the time. We were on tour, uh, their Tattoo You tour, which was like 1981. And we had two days off in San Francisco. And I flew down to L.A., and I did the recording. I did the project for Chariots of Fire uh, in L.A., and then I went back up to San Francisco and continued my tour with, uh, with the Rolling Stones. So that was done, and then we, finished up the, uh, then we finished up the Chariots of Fire project after that. And uh, it was a big surprise, you know, to win it, to win it, my first Grammy from that, you know. The actual recording itself, were you expecting anything special? Like, was that just another one of your many, many gigs? You know, I played so much and I played on so many pop things that it wasn't unusual for... A, a, a pop date or, or, or an R&B date in that way. You know, the only thing that was different about it was it was in my name. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know, you have to understand, you have to understand me, Nick Hill. You know, I've been studying and practicing since I was 13 years old. The music that I grew up listening to was John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, uh, Eric Dolphy, Joe Henderson, 
and and all of these incredible musicians. So basically, I was really very overtrained for pop music. You know, uh, the music that I listened to when I was a kid growing up, you know, when I listened to John Coltrane, when I listened to Eric Dolphy and all of these people when I was a kid, when I was 13 or 14 years old, I just thought that everybody played that way. I thought that that was the way you played the saxophone. So that's how I learned how to play the saxophone. So I was 21 or 22 years old before I realized that the people that I spent all of that time listening to for hundreds of hours were some of the best saxophone players that ever lived, period, right? So all of the technique and all of the information that I learned from their playing and from studying that music and from going to Berkeley and studying all those scales and everything, it made it extremely easy for me to do R&B and pop-oriented music because the music was a different, a simpler, a, you know, a, a, a more innocent form of music than what I had learned, you know. So for me, I had to unlearn. You know what I mean? I had to, I, I had to unlearn in order to do pop music and a lot of the blues stuff and a lot of the R&B stuff because I had too much knowledge. You know, when you grow up listening to John Coltrane, it's very hard to play the blues, the simple blues. You know, so I had to simplify my concepts. So what happened with me in playing pop music and playing rock music and playing, uh, you know, commercial music was, I had, to, I had to simplify my playing a lot. And what I did during that time was I focused on my sound. Because when you play on a pop record, when you play on a rock record, there's nothing you can do really harmonically. Most of that music is blues-oriented music, or it's simple music chord structurally uh, so there's not a lot you can do as you know what I'm saying is you don't play a Charlie Parker solo on a Marvin Gaye tune you don't play a John Coltrane solo on a Barry White tune you know you, you simplify what you do harmonically as far as the notes you choose and the chords you play but that puts more emphasis on your sound. When all, you, when all you can play is three or four notes, when you only have a choice of three or four notes, then it's very, very important about the sound that you get, your tone quality that you get on your instrument. And so people hear me play and they say, well, I can always tell it's you because I can tell your sound. And that's because I spent I spent a lot of time working on my on my tone too. I wanted to get to what happened was really exciting in 2004. You started your own label. Now I want to, if I, if I could, go over the the, the the tracks in each song, um, and if you could just give me a brief description of. I want to try and see if I can get through as many as I can. Um, we'll start with Alive in 2004. Could you talk? Let's just go track by track and just give me a, uh, what comes to mind really briefly on each track. So let's go with 3 plus 5 equals 4. Could you talk about that track? Yeah, that's a rhythm pattern. And so 3 and 5 are a rhythm pattern in that tune. And so we wrote the melody. I wrote the melody around that rhythmic pattern. So that was what the, that's why that is like sounds like that. How about River of Light? That's in 3/4, it's a waltz and it's reminiscent of a song that I that I that I like to play called All Blues and it has that feeling. It was a Miles tune. River of Light 
every I, it's <laughs> it alludes to a vision that I had of the 405 freeway. It comes down the hill, going from uh, going from the city side into the valley side of Los Angeles, and at night there's this hill that's just solid lights, you know, because it's a traffic jam. So it's a river of light. One side of the road is white light, one side of the road is red light, but it's a river. It's just this, this continuous river of light. So that's where that came from. Now talk about the plan. That's, a, that's like a jazz sort of a march that I, that I wrote that has, a beautiful, that has a lovely melody to it that I came up with. Yeah. Great. And how about Angel's Flight? That's a very, very energetic tune, and uh, it's it's about energy. It's about velocity of energy, and people think of angels. You know, people think of little angels in white robes with wings that float around like butterflies, and there's a lot of different kinds of angels. So this angel is an energetic, powerful angel. What's Ernie? What's your approach to composition? Melody. I usually come from from the melody because I play a melodic instrument. I play a voice instrument, the saxophone. I play a line instrument. So most of the time, I'll come from some form of a line, a melodic pattern. And then I'll fill out the harmony from there. I'll do the basic harmony. I'll write the bass line. I'll get the basic concept. And then I will get together with somebody I know, a friend of mine that plays great piano. And I'll talk about the chords. And I'll talk about what composition, you know, what substitutes or how to deal with the... um, how to deal with the choices. A lot of times when you play a chord in a song, it can be two or three other chords. You know, like when Jeremy and I work together, we'll work together on a tune. I'll have a melody. He's playing the piano. And he'll say, well, what do you think of this? Or what do you think of this? And he plays these different sounds. And then we decide what sound works best. So a lot of the tunes I write, I write in conjunction with really good piano players that I work with. I work with Jeremy, or you see some of these tunes, say, uh, I, I, uh, David Witham. I work with David Witham. I've worked with, uh, I've worked with a lot of different, uh, <clears throat> a lot of different players. Mark Seals from Seattle. He writes some beautiful things, and, and we work together to get the right sound, you know, harmonically. Because I'm not a great piano player, you know. It's like But you do play the piano a little bit. I play some, I play I play enough to do basic composition, but to sit down and go bang, one chord bang, bang, bang like that <coughs> that's difficult for me because I can't do it fast enough to hear the difference, right? So I sit with someone that plays really good piano, and they go, well, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? What do you think of that? And we talk about it in that way, and I make, it helps me make choices that way because it's clearer. It's cleaner. When you write, when's the, do you write any time of day? I mean, it's kind of off the wall, but like, do you, is it morning's good, nighttime's good? When, when, when do you work? When I'm practicing. I usually write while I'm practicing, so I'll be I'll be working on something harmonically for my horn. I'll be practicing my instrument, and then I'll hear a line, and then I'll play that. Or my friend Mark Seals, sometimes he'll give me a cassette that'll just be harmony. It'll just be chords. It'll be chord patterns or sets of things. He'll say, "Hey Ernie, I'm working on this thing here, and I've got this set of chords." And uh, what do you think? And then I'll listen to what he's done, and I'll put a melody with that or make some changes to that. So I'm always working on things from sound, things from melody. Mm. And how many hours do you practice a day? Two, two and 
two or three. Unless I'm unless I'm traveling, unless I'm on a plane, I try to practice at least two hours a day. Could you talk about the album Spirit Song, two thousand and five? Talk about the the Bubala dance. Yeah, Bubala is a is like a it's it's a it's a word that my wife and I made up. It means you're sweetie. My wife is my Bubala. She's my she's my Bubala. You know, I'm her Bubala. That's what that's what it means. It means my it, it means my sweetie, you know. Uh, I wrote that with Jeremy. And uh that was a thing that we did where I had written a line and I re- I wrote this fast line and we were working, we were doing a tour. I usually write with Jeremy when we're on a tour. We usually try to write a couple of tunes together. Any, every time we get together, we try to write a couple of tunes together. And this one I wrote with Jeremy, and uh, it's from it's it's from a fast line that I wrote, and then we worked out the harmonies to it. And how about the Spirit Song, the title track? Spirit Song I wrote for the flute. You know, when I got married, Patricia and I, we went on our honeymoon. And we took, I, we take the trains when we tr- when we travel in the U.S. When I when I do gigs, when I do domestic gigs around the country in the U.S., we go on the trains. And so, when Patricia and I got married, uh, we took our honeymoon on a train. We went from we 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 went across the country on a train. And so we went uh, as part of that. Our part of our honeymoon trip, we went to uh, uh, New Mexico, right? And so when we yeah, so when we went to New Mexico, we went up to uh, we went to Albuquerque, and then we went up to uh, now I'm spacing it. Patricia, where did we go in New Mexico? Oh, we went to Santa Fe. We went up to Santa Fe, New Mexico for a few days. And they had these Native American flutes that uh they that they had there. And Patricia bought me yeah, Navajo flutes and uh she bought me this flute in the key of A minor. And so I wrote a tune for this flute. And that's what that's what Spirit Song is about. And you hear this little Native American flute in the beginning and the end of this piece, and that's the flute that Patricia uh, bought for me when we were on our honeymoon. Oh, uh, now let's move on to Analog Man. What was your um, goal with that album? Uh, my goal with this album is the same as my goal with every other album that I've ever made in my life, as far as Flying Dolphin Records go. It, it's an it's an opportunity to play the best music I can to the best of my ability with uh, people that I love and people that I respect musically. Uh, this is my European group with Christoph Sanger, Rudy Engel, and Heinrich Kerberling. And uh, most of my albums have been with this group because we I, we spend a lot of time in Europe, my wife Patricia and I. And my goal with all of my albums is to play the best music I can, the best that I can, you know, to grow and to do music that is stimulating to me. So that's why I choose the tunes I choose. That's why I write the tunes I write is to create environments for myself where I can grow and get as good as I can possibly get. So every CD I do, I do them to be better than the one that came before. So every one that I do is one to, is, 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 is better than the next one, and that's, that's how we grow. That's how life goes. As a Singaporean, could you just say a few words about Jeremy Montero? I think just so the people of Singapore know the artist that he is and what your opinion of him is as a musician and as a person. Well, I think he's I think he's a great artist, and I think he's a very, very 
brilliant man. You know, he's very he's very bright, he's very loving, and he has dedicated his life to bringing jazz music to poor Asia and the world. And he's a great player. And uh, I think he's doing really, really beautiful, beautiful work. And he puts together great concerts. You know, I've done a, many, many concerts with with Jeremy. The concerts at the Esplanade, the concerts with orchestra, the concerts with small groups, the concerts with or, his organ band. And I think he's, uh, I think he's a great master. Ernie, let me. I want to end off with a couple of fun questions and name three musicians that just really, that you absolutely love. Well, related to my background, John Coltrane, Keith Jarrett. Maybe we could just spend a little bit on maybe a quick description on why they're important to you. So maybe why is John Coltrane important to you? Well, because he he set his music set me on my musical path. Uh, the energy in his music, the sound of his music was my first inspiration to want to be a musician. His playing was incredible. He was the best saxophone pe- player, physically the best saxophone player I've ever heard. He played things on the saxophone that were beyond the saxophone. He played something that had never been played before. That's the mark of a great artist. That's the mark of a master. It's someone who creates something that has never been there before in that form. And so that's why I have always listened to and I still listen to John Coltrane. You mentioned uh, Keith Jarrett as a second name. Could you talk about him as well? Yeah, Keith Jarrett is is all melody. Everything he does is a beautiful, beautiful composition. Uh, everything he plays has a beautiful, flowing, melodic form, and I aspire to that. I aspire to m- creating beautiful melodies, and Keith Jarrett is a master at that. Now, could you give one more name? of a musician you absolutely love. Yeah, Pat Metheny. For the same reason I love Keith Jarrett, I love Pat Metheny. Because his music is so melodic and so touching. You know, and then of course there's and of course there's everybody. You know, of course there's Duke Ellington. Of course there's Thelonious Monk. Of course, there's all of, you know, there's Dizzy and Bird. You know, you can't mention our music without mentioning these people. They're all a part of what You have worked with pretty much everyone. For you, who are your top arrangers? Top, give me your favorite arrangers, top three. Oh, Oliver Nelson. Uh, I really love the way Dave Grusin writes and arranges. And... There's a guy in California here that you probably have never heard of that wrote for years for The Tonight Show, Mike Barone. Fantastic arranger. You played classical music starting out. Do you have who are your favorite classical composers? Beethoven. Why Beethoven? Because he's strongly, strongly melodic. Igor Stravinsky, because he was strongly, strongly, Strongly rhythmic, and Ravel, because it was just so beautiful. Well, Ernie Watts, I mean, such a pleasure to talk to. Like one of the top guys in the world. I mean, I mean, it doesn't get better than talking to an Ernie Watts. I can tell you that. It's such a pleasure for me to talk to you, and I'm sure my audience really appreciated all that wisdom and knowledge that you shared. Uh, I mean, really, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. And I, I do hope to talk oh, to you again it great. soon. It was great talking with you. Oh, man, it was f- wonderful. And I hope to, see you, hope to see you the next time I come to Singapore. Oh, absolutely. And I saw your last album was Wheel of Time. Do you have another album coming out? We have another album coming out that's not finished yet. 
and uh, that'll be out in June, and uh, that's going to that's going to be called Home Light. Where are you going to be playing upcoming tours? That uh, we can just go to your website, but any cool tours you want to mention? Well, I'm doing. A, I'm going to Europe in July. I've got things to do at the festival in uh, France and Saint Moritz, and then I'm going to also Spain. I have uh, concerts with uh, Diane Shore, great, great singer. I'm working. I work a lot with Diane. We're going to be working in Las Vegas. I have a very special concert on June 1st at the Kennedy Center. That's a uh, tribute to the music of Charlie Hayden. I play with Charlie Yeah, Hayden we didn't get like a chance four. to talk about that, but that was a very important yeah. part of your career as well. Right, and I've got a festival that I'm playing in my hometown. Wilmington Fair has a Clifford Brown Jazz Festival. I'm going to be playing there. Uh, and, you know, it's just a whole lot of different things, working at the uh, the the Los Angeles uh, uh, Museum of Art. Uh, they have a festival series there. I'll be make, doing a festival there. Uh, working in Austin, Texas. Uh, I have a thing at a church that I'm doing in Lamert Park. And, uh, it's called uh, part of the Park Size Jazz Theory Series. So quite a few things quite a few things well you're such a pro and i think I, I think all young musicians can really take inspiration from the fact that you're just you're a working guy man i, re- I really respect that and you do it at such a high level well, so thank you. ernie watts thank one you. of the greats i mean one of the greats thank you so much ernie great talking to you all right Nikhil. great talking with you too bye-bye Thank you so much for listening to my interview with the legendary Ernie Watts. It's pretty amazing the caliber of guests here on the Nikhil Hogan Show, and I really hope you enjoyed the interview. I'd be so appreciative if you were able to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes so we can continue to bring more amazing guests to the show. Thank you again, and I'll see you at the next show.